Okay, great. So uh, today we're glad to have uh, Chen Xiong Su from Duke University. So give a talk on harmonic analysis on certain spherical varieties. Please. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to be invited to give the talk of our recent work uh, on harmonic analysis on certain types of spherical varieties. So uh, this is based on a joint work with my advisor, Jay Skase and Spencer Leslie. So uh, in today's talk, uh, it will be divided mainly into three parts. So first I will give a brief introduction of Berfman and Karl Stone's program. And then we will focus on two specific cases uh, that are fully established. So one is Berfman Karlstadt space attached to maximal parabolic subgroup of a simple split simply connective group. And then the other one is of the main interest that is affine spherical varieties that are built out of triples of quadratic spaces. And so to begin, I would like to first settle the conjecture that we are interested. So let G be a connected split reductive group over F. So F can be a global field or a finite field. And a G, we say a G variety X is spherical if it is normal and has an open Borel orbit over the algebraic closure. And the what's, uh, what's Poisson summation conjecture say is that there should be a notion of short space a Fourier transform and a summation formula attached to each affine spherical variety. So this conjecture is, uh, was originally brought up by Bergman and Karlstein and uh, in a setting of reductive monoid, but later by the work of Lovework and No and uh, Sacularides, it is refined and it's extended to the setting of affine spherical variety. And given that a lot of people have contributed to this uh, uh, work, so we just, we like to refer this as Poisson summation conjecture. And so to be more precise, uh, so now I will uh, let F be a global field and we'll fix a non-trivial additive character and X be the affine spherical G variety. And we'll let X circ denotes the open G orbit then uh, the notion of short space uh, should be defined in, the lo in locally. So it should be a restrict tensor product of the short functions at each place. And it's, it's taken with respect to some basic functions. So actually there are more structural conjecture, uh, like conjectural structure on the short space. So for example, we would expect uh, the short space is uh, defined um, at least on, um, on the open orbit and it's a smooth functions. And the, in the Archimedean setting, we will expect it's rapidly, rapidly decreasing. Or in a, in a non-Archimedean setting, we will expect it to have compact support uh, in XF. So, and furthermore, in the, in the Archimedean setting, we will expect it to be a fresher space or even a, with, nuclear, uh, with nuclear structure. And, and now for these basic functions, uh, there are conjectural description by Sacularides, No, and Boutier. But, uh, and I think there are lots of verified cases in a finite field case, but uh, in general, it is not known whether this, uh, this definition really coincides with what one expected. And, and together with the short functions, uh, sorry, to, together with the short space, there is a notion of real transform that is also defined locally. So, in, in, uh, so that is one would expect the real transform would preserve the basic functions at unremified places. And lastly, uh, for the uh, and lastly, the Poisson symmetry formula is if you are given a uh, Schwarz functions, then the sum of the uh, sum of f evaluated at the 
open orbits should be equal to that of the Fourier transform of F up to some boundary terms. So in a classical setting, when X is the vector space, then the open orbit is the complement of the origin. And in this case, the boundary terms are the value at the origin. But uh, in general, there is no that there is no precise statement of what these boundary terms should look like. And it's purely conjectural. So, uh, so this Poisson summation conjecture is, was brought up by Brett Fenn and Kajdan uh, in a work that they want to generalize uh, Goldman and Jocquet's work on GLN. So let me briefly recall what Goldman and Jocquet's uh, work on GLN. So for, uh, for simplicity, I'll set F be a non comedian local field. And let's Q be the cardinality of the residue field. And let's pi be an irreducible admissible representations of GRN. And then attach to each Schwarz functions on N by a metric space and a, me and a metric coefficients F of pi. The zeta functions defined by the integral of the Schwarz functions will multiply the uh, matrix coefficients and by a, a power of character. And they show that this integral is absolutely convergent for real part of S sufficiently large. And they admit a meromorphic continuations and defines the rational functions in QS. And what's more, if we collect the zeta functions, then they form a fractional ideal and its canonical generator is a shifted uh, L functions. So what they actually show is that, uh, how they actually show the meromorphic continuation is they establish uh, functional equation uh, by Fourier transform. And in, in these functional equations, there is the uh, occurrence of the gamma factors. <laughs> And so uh, Bergman and Kajdan observed that this is actually a special case, uh, the case where G equals GLN. And you have a standard representations of the complex dual of GLN to GLN, which is the identity. And so they propose the following. If, uh, so based on the local Langlands conjecture and uh, Langlands functoriality principle, they propose that, so G is general, a reductive group, and you have a representations of a uh, uh, dual group of G to, uh, to G or N. Then you should be able to attach a, a reductive monoid of these representations and give a notion of Schwarz functions. And you replace these determinants by a character of G. And then you still uh, consider these data functions and you can and then ask the following, uh, the following three statements if this is true or not. And uh, so this is, so if the Poisson summation conjecture is true, like if it's fully established, then one can, pos one can possibly deduce these three statements uh, from from the work of, uh, from the Poisson summation conjecture. And what's even more, the, the, the role of Poisson's, uh, Poisson summation formula allows us to show the analytic continuations of global L functions. And hence by converse theory, this would imply the Langlands functoriality in great generality. So that's the main reason why, like, why, uh, why they uh, brought up the Poisson summation conjecture. But uh, in today's talk or in, in our work, this is, I mean, this, mo this motivation is important, but in our work, we only motivate, uh, we're only focusing on uh, the, the, the this specific conjecture. So not the motivation, but only the statement of the conjecture. So uh, we will only focus on the harmonic analysis part of these statements, but not the original motivation. 
So, uh, so let me uh, discuss what has been done uh, in recent years. So from now on, F will be a local field. And I will assume the derived group of G is simply connected. So Berkman and Kajdan in 1999, uh, they established the first cases, which is a G quotient by a maximal unipotent subgroup. And later, uh, they extend these results uh, to G quotient by the derived group of P, where P is any parabolic. And this space are uh, usually known as pre-flag variety. But given that Brevman and Kajdan are, are the ones who uh, actually establish these cases, uh, Jay started to call this space Brevman and Kajdan space. And so I would uh, follow his terminology. And so, so it's good to know that the work of Brevman and Kajdan is actually built up by representation theory. So it's uh, purely algebraic. And there are several other works that are in the same setting. So in a case, G is SP2N and P is Siegel parabolic. Uh, Gaze and Liu in, 20, in your 2020s paper, they established this case uh, based on Ikeda's work on triple product L functions. And the approach is analytic. So their work actually deal with both Archimedean and non-Archimedean case. And uh, in a similar setting, but SP4N, and so P is still single parabolic, uh, Jiang, Zhang, and Luo, also in 2020, uh, they established the same results and their work is by Gusa's work on pre-homogeneous vector space. Space. And but they only deal with uh, periodic setting so far. And let's see, uh, it's a cone case. So it's a vanishing of a non degenerate quadratic form. It's by Kobayashi. And his students, Mano, I think in 2011. So their work is to uh, use minimal representation. Uh, can I have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, could you be a little bit precise what if I the cases is it for the uh, summation conjecture? Or uh, I, I heard that you have actually a piece of the conjecture, right? So, yeah. Uh, so, so you are saying if there is an established like, pos pre like four Poisson summation formula in this case? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what if I the which precise statement? <laughs> That's my question. Which precise statement is verified? Which precise yeah. statement? Ah, yeah. you mean in your work? Uh, yeah, your all the work you are just talking about here, so. So, uh, okay, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so, so maybe I can, so I will discuss some, like some question they are still not addressed in your work later. So maybe, oh, okay, sure. yeah. yeah, I'll answer that later, okay. okay. Yeah, so, uh, so back to this. Uh, so the cone case is established by Kobayashi and his students, Mano, and they deal with real setting. And so uh, while these three approach, Bergman, Kajdan, and Gaze Yu, and Zhang Zhang Luo, like looks different, but they turn out to all be the same, but it can be verified through our work. And so lastly, uh, which is our main interest is the is uh, affine spherical varieties. They are built out of triples of quadratic spaces, and uh, the Poisson summation formula is established um, in the paper by Gaze and Liu, and the notion of short space, and the existence of real transform is established by Gaze and I. And it's also good to mention that uh, there is a twisted version. Uh, twisted uh, summation formula. Uh, 
uh, by uh, Jay's another student, uh, Pam Gu. So, uh, so it's good that we have all these known cases, but there are several issues in this oh, in this established cases. So, uh, the first one is most work was only written in the non-Archimedean setting. So, I mean, Berfman Kajdan. Berfman and Kajdan proposed their. Uh, Can I make a comment before you go any further? Uh, yes. In your references, you should mention Piotrowski, Shapiro, and Rallis, where everything was based on. I mean, even the work of Kajdan. And uh, I mean, when they started this case of G over P derived, that's really due to, uh, I mean, they may not, and they do use, I mean, the Fourier uh, transform is a normalized intertwining operator in the uh -huh. system. And they were really, I mean, influenced by their work. So uh -huh. I you should mention that in, in your talks that in this particular case, especially, which is which is the only case we have anyway, that uh -huh. is, is was initiated by Braverman and Kai, but by, was initiated by Piotrowski, Shapiro, and Rallis. And it was in the 80s. They extended uh -huh. the K to classical groups. And this this whole machinery, in some sense, is completely, I mean, influenced by them. So maybe you should mention this. OK, OK. Thank you. I'll, I'll remember that. So by PS. Uh, sorry, Piesky, Shapiro, and Rallis. Yes. Uh, and I forget, I forgot to mention a point. So, in the work of uh, Zhang Zhang and Luo, they actually use this result to establish uh, the Godman and Jokate's uh, work on GON to the case uh, G equal to uh, GM cross SP2N. And so in this case, the representation is C cross times SO2M plus one, the standard map to GL2M plus one. So the issues of these verified cases is one is that most work was only written in a non comedian setting. So uh, I mean, People expect, uh, people focus on establishing the statements for non Archimedean setting. And they expect that in the Archimedean setting, the notions can be uh, similarly generalized and stated down, but the results or the precise statements was never re like rigorously written down. And the second one is uh, the short space was defined mostly without analytic information. So how Berfman and Kajdan propose the definition is the short space is uh, the short space is the sum of the compactly supported smooth functions and the image of the Fourier transform. So this definition is like really beautiful and neat. But if you really want to get any analytic information out of the functions in this space, it will certainly be not easy. And lastly, all the Fourier transform defined above was either defined on an inexplicit space or was defined in an abstract way. So, I mean, given these three uh, issues, it will certainly be a problem if you want to apply analytic techniques to establish analytic results. So that is actually one of the reasons why uh, Zhang Zhang and Luo rework the special case sp 4 because they want to apply some analytic results so that they can establish uh, this special case. So back to uh, Tong's problem. Uh, so I think for the short space, uh, most of the definition are still following Berkman and Kajdan's definition. So, so like in the Archimedean case, you don't know if there is a natural pressure topology and you don't know the growth conditions of the Schwarz functions. And uh, and the Fourier transform is established, but it's not precise. Like 
it's not easy to it's easy to prove it I mean it's you can you can prove the unitarity of the Fourier transform but it's not easy if you want to apply them and for the summation formula it is usually you will assume the function to be nice to avoid uh, the boundary terms but in general uh, there is no expectation what boundary terms you look like but in a case of uh, sp in a case of sp2n and p is parabolic gaze and you have some work on the boundary terms so it's related to the poles of uh, eisenstein series so does that enter your question And uh, so my goal, uh, the do uh, goal for today's talk is to describe uh, describe explicit space. Uh, on which a Fourier transform can be uh, explicitly written down. In a two specific case that we are going to talk about. So by explicitly written down the Fourier transform is that <coughs> we, we are actually expecting it would looks like the classical one. So the classical one is in a vector space setting, the Fourier transform is you take the uh, Fourier uh, Schwarz functions integrates against an additive character with certain pairing and i will show you uh in shortly that this is true but in order to obtain the correct formula you need uh so some sort of normalization so uh so now we are going to talk about a special case that is a bergman kochstein space and now G will be a split simple simply connected group and P be a maximal parabolic subgroup of G. And I'll let XP serve be the quotient of G by the derived group of P. And XP be the affine closure of XP circ. So it's actually a XP circ union and origin. So it's a point. So in this specific case, Hotz Bergman and Hotz yeah. uh, has worked out is they defined a unitary operator from the L2 space of XP uh, to the L2 space on XP opposite. And technically speaking, they only defined on an in explicit subspace of compactly supported smooth functions and extended by continuity. But so in our work, we define another notion of short space. So our definition is not, we are not sure if they, they are the same as the definition of Bergman and constants. But we show that in our case, the short functions are always L1 and L2 functions. And we show that the, the unitary operator considered by Bergman and Kajdan descends to an isomorphism of our short space. And what's even more, we can actually break down the Fourier transform into geometric parts and twist it by some uh, normalizing operators. So this aug stands for augmentation. So by geometry, uh, we refer that it's the one that I guarantee to show you. So it's you take a short functions and integrates against mm. uh, additive character with certain pairing. So this is like, looks like exactly the one that one would expect to see in the Fourier transform. But for this uh, operator to be coincide with Bergman and Kajdan's work, you need certain normalizing factors. So uh, in the following, I'll briefly uh, go through what, <laughs> how Bergman and Kajdan define this operator. So recall that uh, P is um, P has a decomposition, uh, Levy decompositions, 
and I will let uh, the factor later who denotes the Lie algebra and the uh, heads denote the complex dual. So let's EHF be a principal SL2 algebra in M hat. Then the joint actions of M hat on MP hat induce uh, action of SL2. On the other hand, uh, P corresponds to a uh, simple root. And we define omega P to be the uh, fundamental weights attached to this root. So this is induces, uh, this is an isomorphism from the abelian quotient of M of Levy to the GM. And by duality, this gives an isomorphism of a I mean, a co-character to the center of M hat. And now if we put L to be the highest, the space of high, highest weight factors, and we decompose L into a direct sum of one dimensional spaces, Li, and to each Li, we attach a pair of numbers. So lambda I is the integer that corresponds to the actions of uh, omega P hat, and this, it's not hard to see, it's a positive number. And uh, the SI is the edge eigenvalue divided by two. So it's a rational number that is non-negative. So to each L, we associated a data of SI lambda I. And now to each pair of these numbers, uh, we define a a linear operators on functions on the x op uh, xp opposites by this integral. So, uh, this uh, and we say this integral is well defined if it's either uh, by absolute convergence or maybe some uh, regularizations. And how Berfman and Kajdan define their Fourier transform is that. Uh, they take the Radon transform of uh, functions and then composite this lambda i in a random way. So that's how they define the, that's how they define the Fourier transform. So it's, it's really not, I mean, it's not hard to see that that's the reason why they can only define on a dense subspace of complex supported smooth functions because there will be a conver uh, like convergent issues in their definitions. And we overcome these difficulties by observing that there should be a correct way to compose this data. So the main reason, I mean, the main reason is uh, this should be ordered in the correct way. And so that's why we introduce a notion of good ordering. So we say uh, L or the data SI lambda I has a good ordering if lambda I are all positive and the sequence SI lambda I is increasing, non-decreasing. And so as we have seen, I mean, as long as lambda I is positive, then it's admit a good ordering, which is, uh, true in our case, but what's not easy to see is one can always choose. I mean, for any good ordering, the highest data is always with lambda k equal to one. So this is not easy to see. And actually improving these statements, it's a case by case analysis. We, we don't know a, like a general proof of this statement. We only did it by the classifications of all cases. Now I would like to uh, briefly uh, explain the notion of short space. So F will be a non-archimedian field. So the main transform along a quasi-character chi is defined by this integral. And our definition of short space uh, actually borrows from the work of Gaze and Liu, so by Ikeda. So they collect the uh, K finite smooth functions on the open orbits. 
such that uh, at each g, the main transform is the absolute convergence for real parts of S sufficiently large, and the behavior of the Melin invert uh, transform and the Radon transform of this Melin transform is controlled by the L functions attached to this data. So that means uh, these two are hom holomorphic, so they lie in the ring of QS and Q2 negative S. So this allows this definition allows us to give analytic control on a Schwarz functions. And so as we as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's not known that the complex supported smooth functions is contained in uh, this is not known. So but in a special case where uh, in a special case where G is SP2 and P is Seagull, this is true. So by the work of Gaze Liu and actually by the work of Ikeda. I mean, we, we expect this to be true, but we are not sure if like how to prove it. And so now let's get back to the notion of the normalizing operators. So it's composites in, so we are now fixing a good ordering and it's composites of these data in this specific order, but drop the highest data. And so, uh, so by definitions, uh, on the, uh, from the stress, from the original stress space on XP, the Fourier transform defined by Bergman Kochstan de uh, decomposed by uh, decomposed into the augmentations, and the Radon transform with the highest data. And we show that uh, the composites of these two functors is the geometric one. And this statement really requires we know that uh, the highest data is one. Because in this case, uh, the modular character is actually easy to see. It's 2SK plus 2. So it's kind of a miracle. Like, yeah, it's kind of a miracle. Like, why would this happen? Because it's, I mean, we've never seen similar results elsewhere. And what actually uh, the, uh, the role of the Fourier transform operator is uh, if you take the Melin transform, oh sorry, yes, if you take the Melin transform, then it's actually you apply the Radon transform and multiply by a product of gamma functions. And this is, I mean, this is observed in Shahidi's exposition on uh, Bergman and Kajdan's work. And in this, and in our paper, we prove it in a general setting, like in Archimedean and non-Archimedean. So let me, uh, so let's see a special case. So V is a standard symplectic space of dimension six. So it says the natural right actions of SP6. And P is the single parabolic. And W0 will be the, a representative of the long well element. So in this case, P is self associate. So that is the conjugates by W0 is the opposite. So we have a natural identifications between the short space on XP opposites and XP. And it's, we denote this identification by uh, Iota. And then with, if we, uh, with these identifications, if we composite the Fourier transform operator by Bergman and Karlstein with, the, uh, with Iota, then this definition is actually co uh, coincide with uh, Gaze and use work. And in this case, the data is one, one, and one, two. So this is the highest data, and this is the second one. And so you can, we can, by our work, you can write down the precise formula of the Fourier transform. So it's the geometric one, but twisted uh, by additional. Uh, 
normalizing factors. So before I move on to the why earlier, the three coverages why earlier, any questions? Yeah, um, can I ask why, where does the zeta in the denominator of the measure come from? Zeta in the, uh, it's here. Uh, normalizing operator, it's, I mean, we, we normalize the major, so let's. Okay, it's just a normalization. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question. So is your definition uh, depend on this uh, choice of good, good order? Depend on this choice of good ordering. I mean, uh, which definition? Mu p argument. This, I mean, this is a normalizing factor. Yes. Ah, uh, actually, yes. So there are more. I mean, there are more than one good ordering, and I mean, I think uh, there is some choice that you can make if there are more than one. If there are more than one good ordering, so, so yes, you are right. So it depends how you see how you choose the ordering. But the highest one is always the, the highest one is unique. So that's the most important part. So uh so before we move on to the three cover varieties, why uh we need to study more about this specific case. So from now on, F will be the local field of characteristic zero. And I will drop the subscript P since we are fixing this special case. And there is a natural embedding of three copies of SL2. And uh, in this case, so there is an action of S three copies of SL2 on X circ, and it has a unique open orbit. And we let X zero be a representative of this open orbit. And with stabilizer, that is the product of the maximum unipotence with the condition that the sum need to be zero. So now we are going to define the space Y. So we take three even dimensional quadratic space with non-degenerate QI and no I be a associated well representations of SL2. And we take V to be a product of VI. So Q is the sum of QI. And we let low be the corresponding representations on the short space of V. So the Sirico varieties Y is defined by uh, the locus where they have the, the same quadratic norm. So that is, it's the vanishing locus of, vanishing locus of Q1 minus Q2 and Q2 minus Q3. And its smooth locus is those, uh, are those that uh, and most one of the yi is zero. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and now to each uh, short, short tensor of short functions on xf cross vf, we define a functor that takes if by integrating along the open orbit. And you can show it's a smooth functions defined on a smooth locus. So, so we define the short space uh, simply by setting the image of I of the short space XF cross BF. And it's contained in a smooth functions of Y smooth. And it actually contains the restrictions of the short functions on V to the smooth locus of Y and hence contains the complex supported smooth functions. And there is a natural major on Y that is given by implicit function theory. So defined by this wedge product. And we show that the short, uh, our short space is contained in LP space wherever P is not larger than two. And so now let's uh, start to discuss about the Fourier transform. So, uh, 
uh, the, the notion of real transform is actually brought up by uh, the work of Gates and Liu, and they established the Poisson summation formula. So how they define is, uh, they start with a functions on x f cross v f, and it maps to a function on y by i. And then if you take the Fourier transform on the first vector, and then apply the i functor, this will give you another function on y. So they they establish the Fourier, the summation formula for these two functions. And now the problem is, well, I mean, well, can can this operator on fx descend to only operator on y, right? So that means does there exist a dotted arrow that makes this diagram commute? And so in the work of Gaze and I, we show that if the smooth locus is non-empty, which is a natural assumption, then it's always true. And it's even continuous if f is Archimedean. So I will give a brief sketch of this proof. So the first step is uh, to construct a global field E such that its localization is F and uh, smooth locus of E is non-empty. So in the Archimedean case, it's not hard to see and in the Archimedean, uh, sorry, in the Archimedean case, it's not hard to see this is true. In the Archimedean case, we actually use a uh, Arting approximation to establish the existence of E. And then uh, by the work of Collier Saline, Collier Saline, and Sansuk, uh, the irrational point actually dense in the F rational point. So the second step is to apply Poisson summation formula. So we are to show uh, if if i f is zero, then i f x f is zero. And this is done by uh, so if i f equals to zero by choosing proper auxiliary functions and apply Poisson summation formula. You can show i f x f is uh, zero on the irrational point, and so uh, by continuity this is zero. So that's the basic step. I mean the main steps of this proof. And so I mean it's good that we can establish the existence but it will still be a problem whenever you really want to calculate what's the image of the Fourier transform. So, I mean, up till now, what one can only do is you take a representative and you apply the Fourier transform on X and then you descend down to calculate its image. And that's uh, annoying. And so the main motivation of our work is to derive a formula on Y. And we actually did it. So I'm going now, so we are going to discuss about a free transform, uh, a precise formula of free transform on Y. So it's a little bit complicated. So let me introduce some notations. So let's A be a three vectors on F cross. And we that's the uh, brackets A to be the product of this AI and the fractor R A to be the rational functions. And the curly brackets to the power is defined to be the norm up to uh, to the power of di divided by two minus one. So here di is the dimension of vi. And we show that under a mild assumptions. So that is di to be at least four. Then for f, that is the restrictions of the shortest functions. And the C in the anisotropic locus, so Q C is not zero. We show that there is a really, uh, the formula can be written down as follows. 
So it's a long formula, but if you break down, so first look at the inner one. So it's again, of Schwartz functions integrates against uh, additive character with a pairing, but uh, there is a quadratic, uh, quadratic norm showing up. But other than that, it looks like precisely what one is expecting. And then to get the correct one, we are getting to normalize uh, by integrating along A and Z. And this constant C is, uh, I mean, it can be computed. I mean, it's precise, it's a ratio of the measure. But I mean, it depends on, so C depends on psi, Q, and F. And it doesn't have to be one. So with this formula, we can actually establish the unitarity. So in a, in a case F is non-comedian and with the same assumptions on DI, we show that F of Y extend to a unitary operator and satisfy the plantural formula. And there are more properties. So it's actually a operator of order two and it commutes with uh, taking complex conjugate. And so the only reason we cannot establish these results in our Archimedean case is that uh, in a non-Archimedean case, we have the notion of k finiteness. But in the Archimedean case, the counterpart is the notion of the sub love space on XF. And uh, we are not able to, I mean, this is the main reason why we can establish this. So once the sub love space notion is settled, then the same arguments would imply the result. And for these two results, the proof is, I mean, the naive proof is really easy and short. And I will, in the last few minutes, I mean, in the last part of the talk, I will discuss about the formal proof of this formula. So we start with uh, f y f evaluated at c, and since f is a Schwarz function, we can think of f as i apply a direct functions on x zero, the open orbit, representative of open orbit, tensor with f, and then by definition of f y, uh, its composite with i is the same of uh, i composite with f of x. And carrying out the definition of i is this integral along the open orbit. So now, given that fx is unitary, we can apply the plantural formula. Uh, so think of this as two functions. We can apply plantural formula. So we get the rack of negative x0 and fx uh, of the well representations. So you are actually thinking these functions uh, defined on x, f by extending outside by zero. I mean, it's a formal argument. So, and then so by definition, it's the evaluation at, at negative x0. So this is the main reason, here is the main reason why we rework the work of Bergman and Kostan. We can, I mean, we can apply the formula of uh, on X. Uh, so in this last step, we apply the formula on X and give the, uh, and can, we can write down these explicit descriptions. And then the last step is to restrict to the open Bruja cell. and then carry out the definition and we, you derive the formula. But uh, there are several problems in these uh, formal calculations. So the first one is, uh, 
how can one make this precise? Like list functions is not even L2. So we really need a truncations on the Bruja open cell. So we, we need a truncations. So this is one of the main ingredients of the formal argument. And the last one is to establish that this integral is actually finite. So that is its integral over Z is absolutely convergent. And to, to study, I mean, to establish this finiteness, the first step is to uh, decompose into two parts. One is Z less than Q cos Z. And one is Z greater than Q cos Z. So, uh, so here Q cos Z is, I mean, Q cos Z is in an isotropic locus really plays a role. And for this part, we need to apply another one that is van der Kolpe lemma. So that is to say, uh, the sidebar of Z square uh, RA along a compact set and with, yes, along a compact set, this integral is dominated by Z to a negative power. So this functions actually plays a role in establishing the finiteness. So that's the main, uh, I mean, the key results in establishing the formula and unitarity. So, uh, so I think that would be all. So are there any questions? All right, that's the sense of transcendent. Okay, any questions? Well, I mean, it's a stupid question, but how general are these formulas that you have? Are there any other cases besides these? I mean, or, I mean, uh -huh. right is defined by three quadratic forms. I mean, the. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, we only establish for any quadrat, any any space cut out by two quadratic forms on even dimensional vector space. And that's all the case that we have established. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And, but we are expecting like in this, all, all these arguments, there is no reason we restrict to even dimension. So, yeah. I mean, the only reason we <laughs> deal with even dimension is we don't want to go to met metaplastic cover. So we will expect the same, I mean, the same approach and analytic results would apply to all cases of quadratic, uh, cut out by two quadratic form. And in the arc median case, your result is not complete, right? You said you need. Yes, so in our, in the arc median case, we only establish the formula, but to establish the unitarity and the plantural formula, uh, <laughs> The only the only ingredients that we lack of is the sub, the notion of sublove space, and that would be all. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I think in a Kobayashi and uh, Mano's paper, they actually prove uh, the commutative of f so. In a, in a traditional setting, uh, in fx partial equals to fx, I hope I didn't get it wrong. So in a traditional setting, you have this formula to derive the surplus space notion. And I think uh, Kobayashi and Mano in their paper also prove these statements in a concave. Uh, we are not sure, like they, de they deduce it from the minimum representation. And we don't know how, in general, one can prove it. What do you mean they get, get it from minimal representation? 
So they they derive this uh mean they have a good choice of these differential operators mm -hmm. they they find by looking at the action of minimal representations. So let's they allow them to uh like uh, to decide what is the correct differential operator. But in our case, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So the operators are given by the act the, by the minimal representation. Yes, they have, I mean their choice is based on uh uh the action of minimal representation. Okay. So could you go back to the, you see the, the, the mu p arc? Yes. That formula, I mean, so correctly, there's a the formula. Right, so he, no, the, here. Yeah, so so you said this mu p arc, so depend on choice of the good ordering? Yes. but. I mean, you have a fixed one, right? Yeah, because this holds, right? Yeah, so you can you can fix one and then write down. I mean, I mean, like in Bergman and Karstan's work, they don't really fix the order, but they show on a dense subspace that they are the same. I mean, so I mean, they compose it in a random way, and but if you really want a good, I mean, if you really want a Right. If you really want to write down a formula in a good integration, you know, good integration order, then you need to fix the choice. Mm -hmm. so, so the choice only dependent on, I mean, you only make this choice when you want to apply in an analytic way of the formula. But other than that, I mean, the choice doesn't really matter. You mean this this new this normalizing factor when the value that doesn't change doesn't depend on the order? Uh huh. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Let's answer. Thanks. Okay.